Ah. Wow. So let me just take a few moments, uh, highlight a few things. Uh, one, uh, for those of you online, your outline is available in the description box. So we do have an outline. I forgot to mention last week, for those of you online and in person, uh, that we did list resources, books, articles, videos, for us to utilize to continue to grow after Sunday. Tell somebody, I live Sunday through Saturday. I don't just live on Sunday. I live Sunday through Saturday. I need stuff to help me get through Monday to Saturday. Amen? So we try to provide some extra stuff to help you get through the rest of the week. Uh, so the same is true today. We also utilize YouVersion, uh, which is a free Bible app. Uh, so I want to encourage you, download that. The outline is also available in YouVersion under the events section, which is typically bottom right corner. Click it, events, type in 61604, which is our zip, and St. Paul Peoria will come up. Just want to get you an outline. Uh, some of you brought notebooks. How many of you got notebooks? Uh -huh. How many of you taking notes on your phone? I know I'm old. I said notebooks, right? My fault. Forgive me. All right. So hopefully you're taking notes because uh, we understand there's a whole bunch of stuff that God wants to say uh, that we want to make sure we record so we can be able to live it. Let me highlight uh, three things real quick. We'll be on Facebook Live uh, this week on Wednesday. I uh, want to encourage you to join in St. Paul, Peoria as we just provide Again, a word of encouragement to help you make it through the week. Uh, we're posting things on social media almost every day to try to help you. Sometimes it may be a video, sometimes it may be scripture, whatever it may be, just to encourage us to make it through the week. So we want to encourage you to follow us, subscribe, like, comment, share. Follow, subscribe, like, comment, share. What are we going to do? Subscribe. We good, all right? So let's do that. Let's do that. It'll help us get the word out to other people. If you turn on your notifications, then you'll know as soon as we're online, if we just jump on because we had some insight we wanted to share, uh, then you'll know as soon as we're online. And while we're talking about that, I want to thank, uh, I believe she's online, uh, I want to thank Sister Veronica Walker, uh, one of our members. Sister Veronica Walker does an excellent job sharing things that we put out on social media, on YouTube and Facebook. So can we praise God for Sister Walker wanting to share the gospel? Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Walker, uh, for believing that if God can use this to impact my life, I believe he can use it to impact somebody else's life. So we just want to say thank you for all of your sharing. Last thing I'm going to highlight, uh, well, two other things. Some of you come and you say, man, you guys don't give at your church. <laughs> We do give, so let's highlight how we give. Uh, we give now digitally, so we give uh, via our website, we give via cash app, we give text to give, so if you desire to give to support this ministry, to partner with us, then we want to encourage you, those are the mediums to give. We also have receptacles in the back of the sanctuary that are on the wall, uh, so if you want to place something in an envelope, you can do that and drop it in that receptacle. Uh, that, those are the way to give. So a number of people say, man, you got, I noticed you guys don't give. You, you don't talk about giving. Uh, believe me, we need money to do ministry. Amen. And we need money so you can see in here. <laughs> Amen. We have a 77,000 square foot building. And if you imagine what your bills are like at home, you don't even want to see the bills at the church. Amen, somebody. All right. So uh, those are the way to give. Uh, now, here, here's the thing I want to highlight before we jump to the, the message, and then uh, we're going to do what we got to do and, and rock and roll. First time, uh, friends, online and in person, I uh, want to encourage you. We'd love to connect with you. Any, any first time friends? Did you bring anybody? Anybody bring anybody? Oh, hey, blessing to see y'all. I see the hand. What's up? I see you, right? Online, man, it's a blessing uh, to, to have some first time friends. I uh, saw some first-time friends online, new to the area, uh, work on Sunday and just inquiring more information about uh, what we do during the week so they can connect with us. So we are so delighted that you are connecting with us. Please, if you would, fill out a Connect card. That way we can stay in touch with you. 
you can be aware of what we're doing. And if at any point we start sending you too much, just let us know and we'll slow our roll. Amen. We'll, we'll stop it. All right. So just want to encourage you to do that. Here's the last thing I want to say before the sermon. How many of you have ever binge watched anything online? Anybody ever binge watch? Thank you all for being honest. Sometimes people get in church and for no reason they just lie about simple stuff. I've, I've never watched anything on stream. I've never, never done it, right? <laughs> it's, like, it's like you're human. It's all good. It's all good, all right? So uh, in, in just a few weeks, starting next Sunday, uh, we are beginning to binge on Jesus. Right? So there are a whole bunch of other stuff that you've watched, you've taken in, you've put in a lot of time. And after putting in a lot of time, like watching multiple seasons, you're like, I can't believe I wasted all my time to watch two seasons of that, right? You, you've done everybody else. We're challenging you to binge Jesus with us for the next eight weeks. So starting next Sunday, we're going to binge on Jesus. We're going to have small groups that are studying the chosen. Uh, it's not too late for you to host a small group. We can get you up and running. And that's just basically inviting people you know to say, come hang out. We're going to binge on Jesus. We're going to have a devotional that we're going to read, Harmony of the Gospels. So looking at what the Gospels have to say about Jesus. So as we watch the chosen, we can assess, okay, that was in the Bible. That was extra, right? And we understand that they're projecting, so that was extra, but this is what's in the Bible. Some stuff I can see how they made the connection of what they made, just like you did when you watched the Ten Commandments, right? Anybody remember the Ten Commandments? Just like you did when you watched the Ten Commandments and all the other biblical stuff that we've seen on TV, right? So we just want to binge Jesus for about eight weeks. Uh, the whole goal and desire is for us to draw closer to Jesus, draw closer to one another, and be able to grow in our understanding of who he is, maybe to see him in ways that we hadn't seen him, be challenged by him in ways that we hadn't been challenged by him. Is that all good? All right. Now, I heard a whole bunch of people online. I can't hear y'all, but a whole bunch of people in person said yes. I don't know if that means they're going to sign up for a small group. I don't know if that means they're going to host a small group. I just know they said yes. I have no idea if there's any follow through to their yes. I just know they said yes. That's all I got to say on that. So let's jump in. Uh, for those of you I haven't had the privilege of meeting yet, my name is Deborah Hubbard. Uh, I have the honor of serving as lead pastor here, uh, which means you hear me quite often uh, teaching, preaching, communicating. Today we're finishing up a series entitled Fit Church. Uh, we've taken a journey um, to strive to be fit, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. And today uh, we close out with a message on how we manage our money doesn't make us, but it can break us. Here's the big idea, just in case you go to sleep, and I get it, uh, some of the kids might go to sleep on me unless you sugared them up. In that case, you're not going to hear anything I'm saying because you sugared them up. Uh, but here's the big idea, just in case you check out, focus, faith, and follow through leads to financial fitness. Focus, faith follow through leads to financial fitness. I want to thank uh, all of you. I posted this week uh, on social media, say, hey, I'm processing the message for Sunday, and I want to make sure that I'm kind of hitting where you're itching, that I'm scratching where you're itching, that I'm hitting the target. So give me some feedback. So I want to thank all of you who gave me feedback. Uh, some of the dominant things that I saw uh, as people said, hey, here's what I'm dealing with related to money, was saying no to self on my wants. Anybody? Right? So it is my wants that get me right. Um, budgeting, staying on budget, partnering together in a budget. Heard that one this week. Anybody in the room online? Like, yeah, that's me. I didn't comment, but that's me. All right. Bad habits, decisions that are related to emotional spending and not saving some of our psychology around money. Anybody, that's some of the issues you need to address, all right? Um, just navigating everything, prices of everything going up, like $5 eggs. <laughs> Where they do that, right? <laughs> right? 
So navigating all the fluctuating prices, $5 eggs, $4 gas, right? You know, $20 pack of wings. You know, it's just navigating all of that. So I saw that one. Uh, more month than money. You don't have to raise your hand, just wiggle your toes, wiggle your toes. All right. Uh, a lack of savings to address things that just come up, emergencies, things that just come up. A lack of knowledge or confidence in the knowledge, financial knowledge that I have. Anybody online in person, like, yeah, that's some of my money issues. All right. Uh, credit card usage. Just wiggle your toes, wiggle your toes, wiggle your toes. Uh, determining how much is enough. Mm, they said that one. Growing up in poverty and not wanting to go back. So that whole fear versus faith, right, and how do I manage, and then adjusting because I'm in retirement. I lived one way before retirement, now I'm in retirement, I don't have all that coming in, and I'm trying to adjust my mind and my lifestyle. I want to thank you for all that feedback. Uh, because of your feedback, it helped me uh, to focus in and redirect. So I want to give some practical things up front. Uh, and then I want to anchor us in Scripture. Once we get to Scripture, we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 4. Easiest way to find it is table of contents. Find out what page number it's on. Uh, chapters are the large numbers. Verses are the small numbers. If you have your phone, just click 2 Kings. And you're good. All right? But let me share some practical things, right? So most of us know that managing money effectively can have negative effects on our mental and emotional well-being. Uh, this is not only true for adults, but something we don't think about is that it's true for children as well, all right? So a few negative effects of not managing our money well. One is financial stress, financial stress. Many of us know about that. 72% uh, percent of Americans reported feeling stressed out about their finances. 90% of Americans on one study uh, say money impacts their stress level, right? So their stress level is driven by concerns related to money. One of the things from that thriving survey uh, that stood out to me was this, this right here, this key finding. Roughly 40% of the people who say they're stressed about money report that they are currently taking no notable steps to secure their financial future. I want you to hear that. Of the 90% who say that finances create stress, 40% say, I'm not doing anything about it, right? Which may suggest a whole bunch of things, like I feel defeated, what's the point, why even try, right? It just suggests a whole bunch of things. So the whole issue of financial stress, that's a, a, an effect of not managing money uh, properly. Lack of security. Uh, one study from National Endowment Financial Education uh, found that people uh, who may not be as financially literate don't feel secure. They don't feel as though their financial future is secure. This is that I don't know really what I'm doing. Nobody ever taught me what to do with money, how to manage money. We didn't talk about money in our house. Sometimes the bills were paid. Sometimes the bills may not have been paid. But we didn't know what was going on until there was a problem. And I don't know anybody who knows how to manage money, so I've just been doing the best I can which creates for many people a lack of security. Third negative effect we saw, loss of independence. A uh, study from Consumer Financial Protection Bureau says people with high levels of debt are more likely to feel like they've lost control. Here, here's a thing that really spoke to me related to that one, that, that people who feel like because I don't have any financial security, they've lost control, they move into a place of shame and hopelessness. Again, you can wiggle your toe if you've ever been there. Reduce self-esteem as a result of not managing money. So there's a negative impact. Uh, oftentimes people don't feel as though, man, they can have self-esteem or positive self-worth because I've done so bad with my resources, then it's hard sometimes just to hold my head up. Just wiggle your toes. And then finally, strained relationships. One study found that financial problems are one of the leading causes of stress and conflict in personal relationships. Now, if you marry, wiggle both toes, or t multiple toes on both feet, right? You cannot be married and still have relational tension because of finances, right? With family members. Well, you told me when I gave you the money, you was gonna give me the money back. Now I need the money and you don't have the money, and you're not returning my calls. 
you won't respond to my text. You ain't had no problem texting me when you was like, hey, just hit my cash app. But now all of a sudden, you don't see my text messages, right? Create some strain in some relationships. If you have children, that can create some strain in relationships, right? So money itself uh, doesn't make or break us, but how we manage money is the thing that impacts how we live, the significance of our lives. So what we want to talk today about is this whole notion that how we manage money will either help us pass on virtues or vices related to money management. A financial virtue is a moral principle or habit that governs our behavior. It's a moral principle or habit that governs our behavior. A financial vice is described by one writer as a habit that contributes to a low drain of your finances towards things that do not advance your financial goals. So most of us have financial vices, right? For me, for a long time, coffee from Starbucks at $5 a cup was a vice, right? So most of us have financial habits, patterns, and behaviors that are like a slow leak in our tire. They're not obvious, but they hinder us from making progress to our desired destination. So let's talk for a few moments about vices. Vices are usually a result of a lack of self-control. We pass on vices when we choose not to bring our vices under control. Solomon says, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Lee Jenkins says, without self-control, your finances will dictate your decisions instead of your decisions dictating your finances. A key way to make sure that our decisions dictate our finances is to get on a budget. I know I just said a bad word. But can you just say a budget? Somebody online just type the word budget. A budget cannot be successful without self control. Mm. So let's talk about practically just some steps. I'll give you two steps today related to this, and then after sharing this piece, we'll go on to the scripture. All right? Here's the first step. Begin where you are. Begin where you are. Online, today is a teaching day. Begin where you are. What do we mean begin where you are? What are your beliefs? What are your values? And what are your goals? What are your beliefs? What are your values? What are your goals? All of us have beliefs. All of us have values. All of us have goals, right? A belief. I believe that I am a steward of resources, that I don't own it. It belongs to God. God has entrusted it to me, and I have the responsibility to manage it. What are your beliefs? What are your values? And what are your goals? Sometimes the goal may be I want to pay off some debt. Sometimes the goal may be I want to grow a college fund. Sometimes the goal may be I want to make sure that I'm secure for retirement. What are your beliefs? What are your values? What are your goals, right? All right, so we're beginning where we are, but also beginning where we are, we need to know what's my income? What's my income? Right? If you're a teenager, a young adult, you want to listen in. What's my income? What am I making? What's coming in? Not what I think is coming in. Not what I hope might come in. Not what I'm working on to come in. But what's actually coming in. All right? So don't count it before you got it. All right? So what's actually coming in? Is this helpful to anybody? All right? So what's actually coming in? Here's here's the next thing, beginning where you are. What's going out? I don't know. It's going out so quick, I can't keep up with it. So how do you figure out what's going out? Track it. Put a tracker on it. Right? How do you track it? Keep track of every dollar and every cent. That seems like a lot of work. You want to change your situation or you want to stay the way you are? It got, we got to put in the work. Right? So track it. Take a week, take a month, and just track. Track all of the spending. Why? Because we want to know what's coming in, we want to know what's going out, and we want to know does what's going out align with our beliefs, our values, and our goals. We begin where we are. Step number two, 
bring spending in line with your income. Here's a general rule. The goal is to never allow our expenses to exceed, go beyond our income. That's the goal. Tell somebody I'm not there yet. <laughs> it's all right. You're in a safe environment, right? Go ahead. Tell somebody I'm not there yet. But that's the goal, right? So if we're going to bring our spending in line with our income, we need to establish a budget. A budget is simply telling our money where to go. All right? Dave Ramsey says living on a budget is like a diet. It's hard to get started, but once you begin, it's not as bad as you thought, and the results are fantastic. So what do you do? If as you look at it, if your ends don't meet, so to speak, if there's more month than money, then there are two ways to address that. One way is to increase your income. What can I do legally? Can I just talk to some real people? What can I do legally to increase my income, right? Right, do I need to go to school? Do I need to get a certification? What are my skills? Can, do I need to get a side hustle, right? What can I do legally to increase my income? But here's the thing, understand that increasing our income will take time. So, the second option is reduce our expenses. Ah. In order to reduce our expenses, we need to be able to distinguish between needs and wants. Needs are essential expenses, expenses that are necessary for survival and well-being, such as food, clothing, shelter, health care. Wants, on the other hand, are non-essential expenses that we desire but we can do without, such as dining out, such as multiple streaming services. Right? Because here's the thing, I need to know my needs and my wants because I need to be able, if I'm going to reduce my expenses, I need to be able to put my wants on the counter. Say, you know what, I'm going to put you, I know, I still want you. You are my dream bag. But right now, I have to live in my reality. And you are not in my reality. I don't need 300 stations because I can only watch one at a time. Am I talking to any real people? Right? You're not in my reality. Right? Okay. So, just looking at it. So, another way in, as it relates to reducing the expenses, dealing with our wants and our needs, maybe then looking at things like how do I shop smarter? How do I use coupons? Anybody remember coupons? Right? I remember, like years ago when I was much younger, I would be annoyed when I'm standing in the checkout line. And somebody's slowing up the line because they're going through their coupon. I understand. We're going to take all the time we need. Did you get that one? <laughs> right? Coupons, loyalty programs. If you have a smartphone, put Gas Buddy on your smartphone. Gas Buddy is an app that will tell you where's the cheapest gas in your area. And it works anywhere. Right? All right, so utilizing that. Meal planning. I can't eat out every day. Not if I'm going to cut my expenses. Right? Avoid new debt and save something. Get vices under control so we can limit how many we pass on. Vices, I'm done with that. I want to spend the rest of our time today highlighting the financial virtues of focus, faith, and follow through. I believe these three virtues will shape our financial future and serve as a roadmap for our children and our children's children to be financially healthy. It's there that I want to shift your attention to 2 Kings chapter 4. In 2 Kings chapter 4, we are introduced to a widow, a widow who has recently lost her husband. She was married to a prophet, someone who spoke on behalf of God. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1, here's the introduction to this woman. One of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, 
your servant, my husband, has died. You know that your servant feared the Lord. Now the creditor is coming to take my two children as his slaves. This widow woman has just recently buried her husband. And according to custom, according to law, she's in debt. And the law says that if she cannot pay, that the person she owes can rightfully take her children as servants. So imagine you leave the cemetery, you come back, you get to your house and somebody's waiting on you and they're saying, I'm getting ready to take your sons. You've lost your spouse and I'm getting ready to take your sons. Now as you look at this, please let's note that debt is common. This is a widow of a prophet. Somebody who loved God, somebody who served God, somebody who feared God. You can love God, serve God, fear God, and still be in debt. Have we got to witness somebody? Because we need to hear that, right? Right? That, that I, I can love God, fear God. Now, we don't know what the extenuating circumstances are that caused him to be in debt. We don't know what created this debt, but we do know that debt is common. We just heard the statistic. 70%, 90% people stressed out about debt, right? Debt is common. But here's our reality. There are two primary reasons we get into debt. Here's the first reason, choices. Second reason, circumstances. Can somebody say choices? When we talk about choices, we're talking about either our choices or the choices of somebody else, the choice of somebody we're connected to, somebody we're in relationship with, right? So our choice, choice to manage money poorly, our choice to live beyond our means, our choice to overuse credit cards, our choice as far as student debt, right? And and then now, man, we, we just can't pay it back. Our choice as it relates to having children because how many of you know children are expensive? Rascals cost, right? So our choices, right, retirement, our choices, but also it can be the choices of others. Now, most of you have no idea what I'm talking about, but there are some people who will be able to relate online and in person, right, where your parents put bills in your name while you were still a kid. You don't have to say anything, just wiggle your toes. You can relate, like, wait, 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 how do I have bad debt? I just turned 18. Because you have bills in your name because of the choices of somebody else and their choices have negatively impacted you, right? So we go into debt typically because of choices. Our choices are the choices of somebody else or we can go into debt because of circumstances, circumstances, underemployment, right? I'm working 60 hours but because I'm work, making the wage that I'm making, I still can't make ends meet. I'm putting in the time but I can't make ends meet, right? Unemployment. I lost my job. They decided they were going to downsize. The economy's bad. They downsize. And so every, every almost week we're reading about a company that's downsizing. People are losing their job. Unexpected expenses, accidents that come up, illnesses that come up, repairs, medical expenses are one of the leading causes of people going into debt, right? Re- divorce or relationship issues that create circumstances that cause us to go into debt, the high cost of living that we just talked about that caused us to go into debt, a failing business that now overflows into our personal life that causes us to go into debt. So it can either be our choices or circumstances of life. Debt is common. But just as we talked about earlier, debt is also stressful. Debt creates a burden on us. Created a burden on this woman who lost her husband, is now concerned about losing her sons. And here's the reality. We may not be able to control all the circumstances of life, but we can control our choices and how we respond to the circumstances of life. Did you hear me? So with that said, the first virtue to pass on is focus. Can somebody say focus? When we say focus, here's what we're talking about. Model for your family that when things get hard financially, we keep our focus on God. I'll say it again. Model for your family that when things get bad financially, 
We're not going to allow our focus to be so much on the financial problem that we lose sight of God. Why? Because the God that we serve is always, always, always bigger than whatever we face. The widow couldn't control her circumstance of her husband dying. She couldn't control the debt issue, but she could control the choice she made as to how she was going to respond. This woman cried out for help. One of the first steps towards freedom is admitting that you have a problem. The second is seeking help. But be careful who you cry out to. Because we get to choose to whom or what we turn to for solutions to our financial problem. There are several options, but are they sustainable? The lottery is an option. I ain't looking at nobody's wallet or purse. The lottery is an option. The casino is an option. Escape is an option through drugs, alcohol, and a whole bunch of other indulgences. Laziness is an option. Getting lost in another relationship is an option. But are they sustainable? These things may mask the problem, but they are not sustainable solutions to address the problem. The woman decided that no matter what's going on with my finances, I'm going to keep my focus on God. And that's my challenge. I want to encourage you in your household, whatever's going on with your finances, right? Because everybody's trying to figure out finances right now. Whatever you do, decide that you're going to keep your focus on God, that you're going to turn to God, that you're going to look to God, that you're going to cry out to God, that you're going to listen for God, that you are going to be focused on God. The best virtue, first virtue we can pass on to our children, which means we have to model it, is a focus on God. Verse 2 of 2 Kings chapter 4 says this, Elisha asked her, what can I do for you? Tell me. What do you have in the house? She said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go out and borrow empty containers from all of your neighbors. Do not get just a few. Then go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour oil into all these containers. Set the full ones to the side. The widow chose to turn to the prophet of God because she wanted to hear what God had to say. And here's what she discovered. That God's solution for her debt began in her house. I know that was good. Here's the question. What do you have in your house? What are the resources that God has already made available to you? What are you working with? Notice, this is not an approach from this woman. Of a God, I'm coming to you and I want you to do everything and I do nothing. This woman is not focusing on God to say, hey God, can you just grow a money tree in the backyard and I just go and pick the money off? No, she's going to God and saying, okay God, I need help. And God says, what do you have in your house? See, what God does is God challenges her to consider the resources that are already available to her, to consider the assets that she already has because he's getting ready to give her some direction based on the assets she already have. Can I ask, what do you have in your house? What assets have God already given you? What talent, what skills, what abilities has God already made available to you? And how can you surrender what you already have to God. See, this woman, like many of us, she was allowing what she was going through to cause her not to be able to see what she had. She couldn't be grateful for what she had. What do you have? Well, all I have is, I don't have nothing except a little oil. Can't you hear it? Why? Because when I begin to shift and try to prioritize my focus on God, God says, okay, let me help you be thankful for what's available to you. 
I know it's easy to complain about what you don't have, but can we focus on what you do? All I have is a little oil. Okay. We can work with that. You see, our responsibility is to simply take what we have, apply the instructions of God, and then trust God. Which leads me to the second virtue. The second virtue that we can pass on is faith. Can somebody say faith? Model for your family that when things get hard financially, we're going to exercise faith in God. So here's what the prophet says to us. Um, he says, okay, all you guys a little bit of oil. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go knock on the doors of the people in your community. I want to ask you to ask them for a vessel. Once they give you a vessel, I want you to collect all the vessels. Go back and read the scripture if you don't have it open. He says, and don't just get a few. That's powerful. Don't just get a few. Why? Because what you collect, the work you put in, is going to be directly connected to the provision God makes. So he says, don't just get a few. And once you got them, go in your house, shut the door, and start pouring oil. Now, why would I say faith? Because it takes faith to, to trust God, to, to say, okay, God, here's what you told me. It don't make sense to me, but I'm going to do exactly what you told me. Because some of the stuff we read don't make sense. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things are going to be added. Mm, okay. Don't make sense, right? But she decided I'm going to exercise faith in what God has said. How do you know that she exercised faith in what God has said? She collected the vessels. It takes faith to go knock on doors to collect vessels when you don't see a use for the vessels yet. I got a little bit of oil and you telling me to go collect vessels? I can tell you how much oil I got. The oil that I have fit in the vessel that I have. Why do I need other vessels? It takes faith to believe that God is up to something, to be obedient to what God has said and go collect other vessels. Once she got the vessels, she got the vessels, she brought them back in the house, she shut the door, and she did just what he said. She started pouring. It takes faith to pour. It's crazy. When you got this much oil, you got a vessel like this, and you start pouring. Come on now. That don't make any sense. Oh, God, thank you for that. But here's the beautiful thing. When you're exercising faith in God, you begin to have the opportunity to see God work in ways that you could have never imagined before. It's not until you trust God that you get to see how powerful God really is. When the old folk, you say the Lord will make a way out of no way, they wasn't just saying something. They had experiences of taking a little bit of oil and pouring it into empty vessels and watching God fill up vessels and then have the boldness to say, give me another one. And the scripture says that she continued to exercise faith and poured until there were no more vessels. Here's all I'm trying to say. Pass on the virtue of faith. It says, in this house, we're going to be foolish enough to do what God says related to our money. Everybody else in the world, they can do what they want to do, right? They can live how they want to live. But in this house, we're going to be foolish enough to take the principles that God has recorded in the scriptures related to money and apply them to our lives and trust that the God who gave us the principles will honor what he said. That's something to pass on to the kids. So she did it. She passed on this virtue of faith because her boys got to watch it. And as they watched their mama exercise faith, they now have all of these <laughs> vessels. And here's the beautiful thing I love. She didn't even know what to do next. You read it. She has to go back to the prophet Elisha and say, Okay, um, so God just did something in my house that I did not expect him to do. I got a whole bunch of vessels 
with oil in them. What's next? Ooh, didn't have it, but just got it. It's a beautiful thing when you live by faith. You live by faith not knowing what's next. Come on, come on, come on. I know human is I need to know A to B and A to Z before I start. Faith says, God, you said do A and B. I don't need to know C. I'm going to do A and B, and then once I see your faithfulness in A and B, I'll check back in. So she checks back in, and here's what he says. Here's the, here's the last version to pass on. Follow through. Can somebody say follow through? Follow through. Here, here's, what the prophet, here's what the prophet said. He says, take what you have, sell it, look at God, pay your debt, and thank you, brother. Was that you, Carter? Thank you, man. Thank you. Because everybody else, they're like, hmm, and. And means there's something else. See, here, before I follow through, I want to make the point, but I got excited. So because I'm excited, can I tell you about it and then come back and make the point? Pay your debt and live off the rest. Here's what I got excited about. That God is so good that when we follow his instructions related to finances, God not only provides for the debt, but God provides for a life. See, here's the follow-through piece. The follow-through is, God, I want to know what you want me to do with what you've given me. Because I don't want to mess up your provision. I don't want to misuse your provision. So, God, would you help me to know what do I need to do so I can not only pay my debt, I'm not going to go out and party with the extra. I'm not going to, oh, I got some extra. I'm going to take care of my wants. No, I'm going to pay my debt. And I'm going to make sure that I need to do what is necessary for me to live off the rest. Follow through. Here's all I've been trying to say. The challenge for many of us is our focus or our faith or our follow through. But if we can hook them up as it relates to our finances, because here's the truth. I've been in church all my life. Church folk, in my experience, are great at church, horrible at life. My experience. Great at church. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Right? Make debts and not honor our debt. And then act like it's something wrong with them when they actually want the money that we told them we was going to pay them back. What you calling me for? Because you said you were going to pay us back. Right? And we don't understand that that speaks to our witness. So here's what Jesus says as I close. We can't be faithful with money, material things. Why would God entrust you with food? That's why we decided to end the series on the fifth church in this way. Because a part of our living and loving like Jesus means as a congregation, we want to be better. We're going to start where we are. We're going to deal with no condemnation, no shame, no guilt. We're going to develop a plan. We're going to assess what's coming in, what's going out, what needs to be cut, what needs to be added. We're going to investigate, God, what have you said about finances so that I can apply the principles that you've laid out in your word. We're going to trust God as we follow through on our confidence in God, we're going to discover that God is faithful in finances 
just like he's faithful in everything. So here's how we want to conclude this morning. I want to ask you to take a few moments about where you are, whether you're online or in person. And I know people don't like you talking to them about money. But it's irresponsible for me as a servant of God to not talk to you about money. So here's the question. What is God saying to you? What are you currently modeling your family? Are you modeling a focus on God? Are you modeling faith in God? Are you following Him? Have you been faithful with what God has entrusted to you? If not, what are you willing to partner with God to do about it? If you want to partner with God, just like the woman, it's okay to say, God, I need help. Show me, God, what you would have for me to do so that I can apply the principles of your word to be a better steward of the resources you've entrusted to me. So, Father, we surrender to you. Believing today that you are concerned about our finances because the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. It all belongs to you. You've entrusted it to us. We want to do the best we can, not just with our gifts. We want to do the best we can with the financial resources you've entrusted to us to honor you, to build up the kingdom. So show us what to do. Show us how to do it. Surround us with people who will encourage us, who will support us, who will pray with us specifically in this area. We don't have time for pride. Family needs us to operate in faith. So as a community, we lend ourselves to you. We're trusting you to be at work in our lives. We partner with you to address our finances. To be glorified. In this area where the enemy has worked hard to defeat us, be glorified. We surrender our request to you now. online and in person we started with surrender we want to end with surrender surrender as you surrender let it be an act of worship to our God 